Okay, let's talk about health today then. Right, so we had 2008's market crash. And that was a bad time for movies in general and the anime industry in general as a lot of projects were cancelled and ran into the ground, more ambitious ones at least. So we had this, this little almost independent-like film coming out, having a little cinema run, doing a couple circuits and then disappearing. No trace of it for many years. Outside of Japan, that is. It was a very idiosyncratic left field stylistically from the mind Yoshiki Yamakawa, who happened to have directed High School Girl. But it was an adaptation of Hiro Moto's source material, whose style was captured perfectly within the movie. He seems to be certainly be someone who himself is pretty out there, even though his most popular work is the manga of Return of the Jedi, which is a little bit more down to earth, but has some really impactful frames. I mean, like, what the fuck, man? I love Star Wars now. House is unlike most of Madhouse's output. If anything, it feels like something they would have done back in the first decade of their productions, with its wildly uncompromising style. I see a uh, Marcel Mariama on there, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, definitely a, a passion project if I've ever seen it. But it bleeds that Dasaki energy from its color palettes, its wild backgrounds, and stylistical flourishes that take on more to do with its directorial style and its frame count. You little brats! <laughs> you will settle down! You'll taste my whip! Guess class started. And they're all used to sort of solidify its comedy and playful animation. Now who's helping that out? That's Nakasawa, who's the animation director and character designer, most well known for his work on Shampoo, which has its own sort of sketchy graffiti style, which seems to be in tangent with what we're doing here. I mean, I've heard some people say we're looking at something that's kind of in between Dead Leaves and Soul Eater. But even if it is limited for, for a time, I think that's more of an intention than like a limitation. The show can go really hard when it's needed to. But ultimately, it's the style and its storyboarding from edit to edit, its bombastic impact that really sells it. The absurd premise that only gets like more wild as it goes, starting with the classic truck death that we've known so well in these sort of anime situations, you're going to another world, this time it just happens to be hell, which is designed in a pretty creative way, you know, with the samey backdrops, with its splatter painted energy, with the watercolour feeling everywhere. Almost like German expressionism if it was bursting with colour. One of the things that highlights these backgrounds is the change from the opening, where they're more standard, to this new abstract world that we've been thrown into. And I certainly do love those sort of colour palettes in this film. They really make it stand out from the rest. It's very subdued at times, but with its backgrounds, really contrasting with those characters' more limited palettes, as well as their unique shadows, like atmospherically coloured shadows, which tended to be a thing you'd see more in the 90s than here. It's just neat. When you look at the, the setting to begin with of Hells, it's kind of like pop culture meets its horror icons. From its head teacher, Helvis, all that it takes place in something called Destiny Land, or as it said in Japanese, Destiny. Even its original title being Hell's Angels, which obviously when it came over here that's not going to be the title you can use, it's all tongue in cheek that even gets into the angels themselves, which have a sort of elaborate history to them have to do with Nerasawa designs and toys, of all things. There was a series in the 90s called Resurrection of the Monstrous, which were all designed by a man called Nerasawa. He's a pretty big guy in the design world, especially of Japanese design when it comes to monsters and different shows. Now all of these characters are all sort of inspired of these like classic horror icons, that be werewolves, witches, Frankensteins, or phantoms of the opera, or paradise in this situation. Now, Nirasawa happened to be friends with Hiromoto, so some of these designs ended up being incredibly influential or basically just ripped to be put into the Hell's manga, and vice versa, into this. So it's all above board. But it does give you a perspective of where they're kind of coming from with this. This all seems to be an excuse for the sane attitudes more than anything else. And things do get insane as we go. It devolves at times into batter manga, or sports manga, or existential dread, Christian mythology. All of its direction, cuts, transitions, and nice framing, bringing that together in, the, in a really engaging way. We all work together and win the volleyball tournament. Each of us gets a single wish granted. A pair of girls' panties. Share your energy with volleyballs me. Volleyballs don't summon dragons! The characters themselves are big cutouts exploding in space for the gags, and for sure their designs are bolder than their actual particular personalities. So yeah, there's no, no contesting that with me. But that doesn't mean it's not fun to watch the bombast, as long as you know what you're getting yourself into. Which as it goes becomes perhaps different than what you would have expected. Mario told me about Cain and Abel earlier. 
That was the first murder ever committed, right? Indeed. The first blood of humanity to be spilt came at the hands of Cain upon his brother Abel. There's a big take of the, uh, the Cain myth here. They just sort of run with it in the Devilman style way, you know. Layers of plot twists here. The, uh, the Cain story is one... It's very simple. Cain is jealous of Abel being preferred by, in this case, God. So, um, in short, the man snapped before assassin God about it, as you do. But here they've kind of changed it into something more of a personal story. It's a lot more Freudian, its concepts here. Trying to build up a family life ideal before we get into the story's absurd angles with the reincarnation of Adam and Eve or seven sins happening to be the angels and how possibly, you know, if, you, if you're not careful, your brain's going to melt out of your ears if you try and take it too serious. Chaos only reigns and it's a bumpy ride, but one that's entertaining to follow. You go into this place where it's become something along the lines of divine purpose versus meaningless. Why do we exist? What drives us? You know, a lot of the ideas in this film remind me of the book Man's Search for Meaning. It's one I read back when I was much younger. And it was kind of the idea of a man going through his own personal hell during the Holocaust and trying to find meaning within his events so he could survive the ordeal. We see this constant narrative about love, insecurity, death. These cycles of trauma followed by the idea of what do we desire most? Is it possible to obtain that? Everyone seems to be fighting for something, no matter how abstract or ludicrous. Certainly the, uh, the biblical story of Cain and Abel is one of suffering, of jealousy, of uh, the, the sort of human emotions played out in such a rapid succession. It recontextualizes the story into nothing but a, a family feud, which ultimately gets to ask the question about, like, can there really be happiness without suffering, and vice versa, and how do we justify that suffering? To quote from the Phantom of the Opera, um, there's always the idea that, you know, suffering does not justify you to cause suffering in others. It's never the right way to go about it. You have to kind of break that chain. And everything seems to be broken in this one, because by the end of it, we're thinking about hell as like a social construct for the imagery and folklore, which in these realms, the reality is whatever you make it. Existence is a land beyond this, so it's more about will than anything else. It gets a little maybe big brain for its own good, maybe going a little bit off the deep end with its wild roller coasters of monologues and dubious plans. Is it ultimately positive affirmation of the main character that wins the day? The idea that you can do anything and make friends with anyone? In the corniest sense of anime, you know, is it friendship and one's own will that wins the day? And probably, maybe there's a bit more of that than that, but uh, it does all move back to a, a sort of the collectivism and love classic tropes when coming to find purpose, which usually isn't exactly a, a bad way to find purpose. But I can't say that hell is breaking any profound uh, philosophical levels of um, literature here, but maybe I'm missing something out. Maybe I'm missing a key element to the, the search for meaning that we're seeing in front of us. Wishing, believing, those alone won't be enough with your fragile ideals, Mario. The world can only do so much. It's one way or the other. It goes, we're going in every direction, even if it's all forgotten, but not necessarily in the heart, where it's the most important. We do come full circle at least. And the movie unwraps itself definitely in those last 30 minutes, but it can be visually arresting. It's a fun world with big characters, even if it might be a little bit too long for my taste, and could do with a bit of a cleaner ending, with all its different subsections of boss battles and concepts where the film feels like it could have ended three times beforehand. But really, hell is an experience that you have to journey yourself through. The strongest area for me in the film is most likely the volleyball section, because it really gets to highlight the introduction of crazy characters that can bounce off each other while using its sane attitude and action to really highlight what Hells is going for. It's not necessarily about where the destination ended, but certainly it has a good energy to it. Those that like the style are probably going to be enamored by it regardless of how you know ridiculous it gets by the end. If there was anyone that was going to do this production, it was going to be Madhouse. And I appreciate that about them. I do wish it was easier to get your hands on it. I mean, in 2012, they released the first Blu-ray, which was region unlocked, but it was only for Japan, even if it did have a sub-file. But, but now, let's push it back to two years ago, when Discotech had the rights to distribute it, maybe three years ago even. And that's where Team 4 Star come in. Probably the biggest in the Anitube scene. Certainly the biggest of Bridges. Now when Discotech picked this up, the uh, certain individual at Discotech was really uh, enamored with the idea of dubbing it and thought that Team 4 Star would be a pretty good pick for it in terms of its stylistical humor. So they waited a whole year to get this promo dub done. And to be fair, it's not exactly uncommon for voice actors to get their start on the internet or in the abridged scene nowadays. 9S. To be. Come on. Let's go home. Now, the best info on like the actual technical side of this would probably be the cartoon cipher video. They had their own disclaimer at the beginning about their relationship with the studio and how they knew a lot of the people there. 
So if I was to disclose my personal relationship, I have actually been watching Dragon Ball Z Abridged uh, since episode one. In fact, I was actually in to the scene of uh, Dragon Ball Abridging back in the day. I think I even tried to make one myself. And this was before Team Four Star was even on the on the map yet. You know, yeah, this is going back a while. When I was younger, I definitely enjoyed watching it. I'm, I'm not exactly a diehard per se, but I did see every episode of Dragon Ball Z Abridged to this day. Out of habit mainly, I suppose, at this point. Because as the years have gone by, I don't quite see their work in the same light as I once did. Nor did I completely love the direction it sort of went into, but I appreciate the craft. Even if it is uh, kind of corny. There you go, there's, there's my epic takedown of Team Four Star. They're kind of corny. It's just I drink my milk. Also your tears. <laughs> Eight floor, you bitch. Now, what are we going to say about this actual dub here? Well, um... Uh, it's okay. It, it's, it's fine. It does the business, I guess. I mean, it had to be localized kind of strongly because of... Such is the case when you're making a comedy anime, right? You have to make those jokes sort of connect within a different language. And I don't think it's a million miles away from any standard dub. In fact, a lot of the people working on it have industry experience. They're all basically professionals. It's the same as any other anime dub. With the exception here that, like, we're working with, like, the Team Four Star people, who've never actually ran an official dub. You know, I feel more partial to their kind of humor and voice cast. That's something here you could get out of that, which you won't be able to get out of the Japanese. The climax of that battle, Kane claimed victory and took Abel soul, and you're not listening. For my sake, listen oh, when God is imparting wisdom. But I mean, both options are there if you want them, right? I think I became more adjusted as I went, and uh, I, was, I was in it by the end. Now, that certainly helps that this is a very visual spectacle piece. And because it's so dialogue heavy towards the end, as well as getting quite dense with it, like what it's trying to convey, I think the dub really does help in that situation. There's a benefit there for most people. Now, going beyond like the quality of the dub as a publicity move, a great move. I mean, how, like, look at my title, like, what am I saying? How do you sell this hard rock flip book kind of thing that's 12 years old without any like serious push? I'm sure it must have helped to sell a couple of units. Actually, as of this recording, the right stuff, I guess it's like a holiday sale on, on the websites, on the internets, on therightstuff.com. So if you actually wanted to pick up a copy of this, go for it. Maybe there was some nice like behind the scenes stuff in there. I have no idea because you know, <laughs> let's just say there's less options back in England. I've also seen it on Retro Crush and Amazon Prime. That is if you're American. In England, I don't think there's any official release for Hells. Not what I can find without a VPN that is, wink, wink, wink. Now there's a question about the Team Force situation that may mire the actual conversation around Hells. It's a point where like, it's known more as the, the, the Team Four Star anime, like my title says, than actually the content of uh, the actual anime. And I can see that. I can see there be, might be an issue there with over-promoting that concept of like, hey, it was dubbed by these randos from the internet age. Isn't that kind of quirky? It's kind of nice to see um, people that you watch for years kind of get their break into a bigger industry. But like I said before, it's not exactly like these people were not already doing those sort of things in one way or another. All I'll say here is any publicity is probably good publicity for a content like this. I'd rather people say that's the Team Four Star anime than get into a situation where it's like, I've never heard that anime and I will never watch it. Hells is definitely an insane ride, but it's probably worth it. So I don't really mind how it gets in front of you, as long as it actually does. But it gets there to begin with and gets to your attention is what matters in the end. I certainly would have never heard of Hells if it wasn't for the Team Four Star announcement. I remember that back in the day for sure. Maybe in a different universe, I'd end up looking at this uh, film where it never got dubbed. And I'd probably be left with a, a raw movie file from 2008. My review would be quite a bit different, I'm sure, in that context. But I think it's cool. I, I give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching this video, and um, cat's on my lap right now, so there's some crazy cat noises. We have at least another five videos left of Madhouse Month, so if you can ring that bell if you want to find out when they are, uh, subscribe if you want to see more content, like the video, or comment, or do something like that, make, make the algorithm do nice things for me. And I've got to thank those patrons, you know, if you want to get in that patron stuff, you get videos early, you get to the Discord, and some other stuff, so check that out. And that's Joven, Alex Moratti, that Puerto Rican guy, and Daniel Strait. I'll catch you next time.